The detective stands with his hands in his pockets and frowns toward the floor. I'm so sorry for your loss, truly. I know how it must look, every murder going unsolved. But there are people who still care, who are horrified by this violence. Please know I will try. He too understands the uselessness of his words, but he feels compelled to tender them nonetheless. He reaches into his breast pocket and pulls out a card with his name and phone number on it. We will need an official statement when you're feeling up to it. Take a few days if you need. He proffers the card, but Lydia makes no move to take it. So Luca reaches up and grabs it. He's maneuvered himself in close beside his mother, laced one arm behind her through the strap of the red overnight bag. This time, the detective doesn't follow them. Their shadows move as one lumpy beast along the sidewalk. Beneath the windshield wiper of their car, an instantly recognizable orange 1974 Volkswagen Beetle, there is a tiny slip of paper, so small that it doesn't even flit in the hot breeze that gusts up the street. Carajo, Lydia curses, automatically pushing Luca behind her. What, mommy? Stay here. No, go stand over there. She points back in the direction from which they came, and for once, Luca doesn't argue. He scuttles up the street, a dozen paces or more. Lydia drops the overnight bag at her feet on the sidewalk, takes a step back from the car, looks up and down the street. Her heart doesn't race. It feels leaden within her. Her husband's parking permit is glued to the windshield, and there's a smattering of rust across the back bumper. She steps into the street, leans over to see if she can read the paper without lifting it. A news van is parked just beyond the yellow crime scene tape at the far end of the block, but its reporter and cameraman are busy with preparations and haven't noticed them. She turns her back and tugs the slip of paper free from the wiper. One word in green marker, boo. Her quick intake of breath feels like a slice through the core of her body. She looks back at Luca, crumbles the paper in her fist, and jams it into her pocket. They have to disappear. They have to get away from Acapulco, so far away that Javier Crespo Fuentes will never be able to find them. They cannot drive the car. Chapter 3. Lydia circles the orange beetle twice, glancing through the windows, inspecting the tires, the gas tank, what she can see of the undercarriage by stooping down without touching anything. Nothing appears different from how they left it, not that she was paying much attention, she stands back and crosses her arms over her chest. She won't dare to drive it, but she must at least open it to retrieve some of their belongings from inside. That need feels urgent, but her mind cannot reach beyond the immediate present, so she doesn't get as far as the word keepsakes. She peers through the window and sees Sebastian's backpack on the passenger side floor. Her own sunglasses glinting on the dashboard. Luca's yellow and blue sweatshirt sprawled on the back seat. It's too dangerous to go home now, to the place where they all live together. She needs to be quick to get Luca out of here. For a brief moment, Lydia considers that if there's a bomb in the car, it might be kinder to take Luca with her, to call him over here now before she opens the door. But her maternal instinct defeats this macabre idea. So she approaches with the key shaking in her hand. Using the other hand to steady it, she looks at Luca, who gives her a thumbs up. There won't be a bomb, she tells herself. A bomb would be overkill after all those bullets. She pushes the key into the lock. One deep breath. Two. She turns the key. Thunk. The sound of the door unlocking is almost enough to finish her. But then, silence. No ticking, no beeping, no whoosh of murderous air. She closes her eyes, pivots, returns Luca's thumbs up. She swings the creaky door open and begins rummaging inside. What does she need? She stops short, her confusion momentarily paralyzing. This cannot be real, she thinks. Her mind feels stretched and warped. Lydia remembers her mother walking in circles for weeks after her poppy died. From sink to fridge, sink to fridge, she'd stand with her hand on the tap and forget to turn it on. Lydia can't do a suspended loop like that. There is danger. They have to move. Sebastian's backpack is here. She must pick it up. She needs to accomplish the tasks immediately before her. 
There will be time later to begin the work of comprehending how this could have happened, why it happened. She opens her husband's backpack, takes out a sloshing thermos, his glasses, the keys to his office, his headphones, three small notebooks, and a fistful of cheap pens, a handheld tape recorder, and his press credentials, and places everything on the passenger seat. Her husband's Samsung Galaxy Tab and charger she keeps, though she powers the tablet all the way down before returning it into the now empty backpack. She doesn't understand how GPS works in these devices, but she doesn't want to be trackable. She retrieves her sunglasses from the dashboard and shoves them onto her face, almost stabbing herself in the eye with one outstretched stem. She pushes the seat forward to see what's in back. Lucas' church shoes are on the floor where he left them when he changed into his sneakers to play football with Adrian. Oh my God, Adrian, Lydia thinks, and the cleft feeling in her chest opens deeper as if there's an ax hacked into her sternum. She squeezes her eyes closed for just a moment and forces a cycle of breath through her body. She lifts Luca's shoes and places them into the backpack. Sebastian's red New York Yankees hat is on the back seat too. She grabs it, climbs out of the car, and tosses it to Luca, who puts it on. In the trunk, she finds Sebastian's good brown cardigan, which she shoves into the bag. There's also a basketball, which she leaves, and a dirty t-shirt, which she keeps. She slams the trunk, walks back to the front seat to select one of his notebooks, not yet allowing herself to consider the reason she does this, to retain a personal record of his extinct handwriting. She chooses one at random, places it in the backpack, and then locks the doors behind her. Luca comes to stand beside her before she beckons him. My son is fundamentally altered, she thinks. The way he watches her and interprets her wishes without command. Where will we go, Mommy? Lydia gives him a sideways glance, eight years old. She must reach past this obliteration and find the strength to salvage what she can. She kisses the top of his head and they begin to walk. Away from the reporters, away from the orange car, Abuela's house, their annihilated life. I don't know, mijo, she says. We'll see. We'll have an adventure. Like in the movies? Yes, mijo, just like in the movies. She slings the backpack onto both shoulders and tightens the straps before hoisting the overnight bag, too. They walk several blocks north, then hang a left toward the beach, then turn south again, because Lydia can't decide if they should be somewhere crowded with tourists or if they should try to stay out of sight altogether. She frequently looks over her shoulder, studies the drivers of the passing cars, tightens her grip on Luca's hand. At an open gate, a mutt barks at them, lunging and nipping. A woman in a drab floral dress comes out of the house to correct the dog, but before she can get there, Lydia kicks it savagely and feels no guilt for having done so. The woman yells after her, but Lydia keeps moving, holding Luca by the hand. Luca adjusts the brim of his father's too big Yankees hat. Poppy's sweat is seeped into the hat band, so little currents of his scent puff out whenever Luca pulls it to one side or the other, which Luca does now at regular interver intervals so he can smell his father. Then he has the idea that perhaps the scent is finite and he fears he might use it all up, so he stops touching it. At length, they spot a bus and decide to get on. It's mid-afternoon on a Saturday and the bus isn't crowded. Luca feels glad to sit until he realizes that the movement of his legs beneath him, carrying the weight of his small frame through the streets of his city, had been the thing staving off the crush of horror that now threatens to descend. As soon as he's seated beside Mommy on the blue plastic seat, his tired legs dangling down, he begins to think. He begins to shake. Mommy puts her hand, arm around him, and squeezes tight. You cannot cry here, Mejito, Mommy says. Not yet. Luca nods, and just like that, he stops trembling, and the risk of tears evaporates. He leans his head against the warm glass of the bus window and looks out. He focuses on the cartoon colors of his city, the green of the palm fronds, the trunks of the trees, painted white to discourage beetles, the vivid blare of signs advertising shops and hotels and shoes. At El Royo, Luca looks at the children and teenagers in line for the ticket window. They wear flip-flops and have towels around their necks. Behind them, the red and yellow water slides swoop and soar. Luca puts one finger against the glass and squashes the children in line one by one. 
The bus squeaks its brakes at the curb, and three damp-haired teenage boys get on. They pass Luca and Lydia without a glance and sit in the back of the bus, elbows planted on knees, talking quietly across the aisle. Poppy's going to take me in the summertime, Luca says. What? To El Royo. He said this summer we could go. He would take a day off work one time when I'm not in school. Lydia sucks in her cheeks and bites down. A disloyal reflex. She's angry at her husband. The driver closes the door and the bus moves off with the traffic. Lydia closes, Lydia unzips the overnight bag at her feet, kicks off her heels and replaces them with their mother's quilted gold sneakers. She doesn't have a plan, which is unlike her, and she finds it difficult to form one because her mind feels unfamiliar, both frenetic and swampy. She does have the wherewithal to remember that every 15 or 20 minutes, they should get off and change buses, which they do. Sometimes they change direction, sometimes they don't. One bus stops directly in front of a church, so they go briefly inside. But the part of Lydia that's usually available for prayer has shut down. She's experienced this numbness a few times before in her life. When she was 17 and her father died of cancer, when she had a late stage miscarriage two years after Luca, when the doctors told her she could never have more children. So she doesn't think of it as a crisis of faith. Instead, she believes it's a divine kindness, like a government furlough. God has deferred her non-essential agencies. Outside, Luca vomits on the pavement once more while they wait for the next bus. Around her neck, Lydia wears a thin gold chain adorned only with three interlocking loops. It's a discreet piece of jewelry and the only one she wears apart from the filigree gold band around the fourth finger of her left hand. Sebastian gave her the necklace the first Christmas after Luca was born, and she loved it immediately, the symbolism of it. She's worn it every day since, and it's become so much a part of her that she's woven her mannerisms into it. When she's bored, she runs the delicate chain back and forth along the pad of her thumb. When she's nervous, she has a habit of looping the three interlocking circles together onto the tip of her pinky nail, where they make a faint tinkling sound. She doesn't touch those golden hoops now. Her hand moves absently toward her neck, but already she's aware of the gesture. Already she's training herself to disguise old habits. She must become entirely unrecognizable if she hopes to survive. She opens the clasp at the back of her neck and slips Sebastian's wedding ring from her thumb onto the chain. Then she refastens the clasp around her neck and drops the whole thing inside the collar of her blouse. They must avoid drawing the attention of the bus drivers who've been known to act as halcones, lookouts for the cartel. Lydia understands that her appearance as a moderately attractive but not beautiful woman of indeterminate age, traveling the city with an unremarkable looking boy, can provide a kind of natural camouflage if she takes care to promote the impression that they're simply out for a day's shopping or a visit to friends across the city. Indeed, Luca and Lydia could easily change places with many of their fellow passengers, which Lydia thinks of as truly absurd, that the people around them cannot see plainly what abomination they've just endured. It feels as evident to Lydia as if she were carrying a flashing neon sign. She fights at every moment against the scream that pulses inside her like a living thing. It stretches and kicks in her gut like Luca did when he was a baby in there. With tremendous self-control, she strangles and suppresses it. When a plan finally does begin to emerge from the violent fog of chaos in her mind, Lydia feels uncertain whether it's a good one, but she commits herself to it because she has no other. At a quarter to four o'clock, just before closing time in Playa Calatia, Lydia and Luca disembark from the bus, go into an unfamiliar branch of their bank, and wait in line. Lydia turns on her cell phone to check her balance and then powers it all the way off again before filling out a withdrawal slip for almost the full amount, 219,803 pesos or about 12,500, almost all of it an inheritance from Sebastian's godfather who'd owned a bottling company and who'd never had children of his own. She asks for the money in large bills.